Well, good morning, church. It's kind of a delayed reaction on this side, so we're going to try it again. I'll look this way. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, well, we are in our series entitled I Am, uh, looking at Jesus in his own words. Uh, the historical figure of Jesus is actually the most talked about person in all of human history. The calendar as we know it is based on um, around his life, B.C., meaning before Christ, A.D., uh, a Latin phrase meaning in the year of our Lord. And, and more books have been written, more pieces of art have been created, uh, and more songs have been sung about Jesus than any other figure in all of human history. But if that is true, what did Jesus actually say about himself? And so he actually gives seven statements in the book of John, and they're called the seven I am statements. And so we're walking through each of those, uh, one each week, and talking about what does it mean and what is Jesus saying about himself in those claims. And so in week one, we talked about how Jesus claimed to be the light of the world, and that means that darkness ultimately leads to guilt and shame, but light leads to grace and salvation. And then last week, we talked about the idea of Jesus being the door. And how ultimately uh, we find security and then our significance in Jesus. And so our security is not found in our situation, but our security is found in our Savior. And then our significance is not found in the end product, but the actual process about becoming men and women of godly character. Well, this morning I want to share with you, actually stay in John chapter 10. Uh, so last week we were in John chapter 10, the first 10 verses. Now we're going to actually look at the next uh, seven or eight verses there. Uh, and so you can turn your Bibles to that, but we're going to actually look at the phrase that when Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, the good shepherd. Now the emphasis here is not just shepherd, but actually good shepherd. So what, what makes Jesus good? And see, the word good that's used in the passage actually means beautiful, excellent, and genuine. And so in other words, Jesus is the beautiful, the excellent, and the genuine shepherd. But if you have something that is genuine, then that means that you also have things that are counterfeit. And so how do we spot the difference between what is real and what is Counterfeit. Well, there's a lot of popular franchises um, here in America, and a lot of products are made in other countries, and they do an excellent job. Uh, and so we send products out, they send products in, and so there's this kind of importing and exporting of products. But what I found is that if you go to other countries, sometimes they don't necessarily um, do it the legal way. And so they, they have a counterfeit or a knockoff version of a well-known franchise, and they try to pawn it off as the real thing. Um, and some are successful, and others, not so much. Here, I got a couple examples for you. Uh, first example here is, notice this one uh, looks close until you read it, and it says, pizza, huh? <laughs> instead of pizza, maybe it should put a question mark after that instead of pizza hut. Pizza, hey, you want some pizza, huh? I don't know, maybe I'm curious to see what's actually in their ingredients. Um, another one here. <laughs> it's, the, it's the sister company of Apple. Um, it's Pear, I guess. Um, and then another one here, if you've heard of Olay. Um, okay, shampoo. You know, who needs the best when you can have okay, right? And then the last one here, instead of Arm & Hammer, Arm and hatchet, arm and hatchet, baking soda. So these are good, good products. Well, um, so I want to take time, and as we read this passage, I want to talk about the difference between counterfeit and then the real thing. And Jesus is going to call himself the good shepherd in John chapter 10. Uh, and then he's going to describe how can you know that he is the real thing, the genuine, the authentic shepherd of God and of his people. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can open up John chapter 10, but also wanna encourage you that if you do not own a Bible, we actually have some nice brand new um, kind of uh, leather Bibles out at the front table here. That those, that's like another gift for you guys. And so we want you to have a Bible. And so if you don't own one, um, at the end of the service here, you can grab one on your way out and then you can actually bring that back with you this next service. And it's, just you, it's, it's yours to keep. So if you have a Bible, open up at John chapter 10. Jesus is speaking. And then in verse 11, let's pick up the story. Jesus says, 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now, if we were to continue reading on, uh, basically what Jesus is saying here, that he is claiming to be God. If you ever hear somebody saying that Jesus never actually claims to be God, you can actually um, take them to John chapter 10 because he says that I am the door, I am the good shepherd. And then actually a little bit later in that chapter in verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are equal. And so Jesus, in fact, does claim to be God. And so what, what does that mean? Um, well, he actually talks about the difference between just a hired hand, a hired worker, a hired babysitter of the sheep, <laughs> and then the shepherd. And you can tell the difference between someone who is just a hired help and someone who is the shepherd of the sheep because willingness to lay their life down. So someone that is a hired hand watching over, someone who is a babysitter, okay, watching the kiddos, when they see trouble coming, when they see wolves enter, like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not getting paid enough. See ya, right? And maybe there's like 100 sheep and you come back and... They count there's 99 because a wolf ate one. If I'm the hired hand, I'm probably just gonna try to convince the owner that he only had 99 in the first place. Like if I see a giant animal going after a smaller animal, I will feel bad, but I don't know if I'm gonna get in the way of a lion, a bear, or a wolf coming in (laughs) to attack a sheep. But it's because it's like, well, they're not mine. They're not my sheep. I'm, I'm hired, I'm paid, I'm paid to do a job, but they're not mine. I'm not gonna risk my life. When, when the risk is higher, okay, than the life worth saving, then I'm like, nope, I'm out. But notice the difference between Jesus, who is the good shepherd. So a hired hand flees in time of trouble. But the good shepherd actually jumps into that and actually fends off and actually defeats them and saves the sheep. Because to the shepherd, the life is always worth the risk. To a hired hand, once the risk gets higher than that, then they're out. Sometimes in religion, you see that too. It's like, well, I'll come if it's convenient. I'll do this if it's convenient. But as soon as the risk goes beyond my inconvenience or my comfort level, or as soon as there's a risk at hand, I'm like, "Eh, I'm out. But the good shepherd, because he loves the sheep, he owns the sheep, he is the leader of them. It's not a question of if. It's just an action of how. And so the difference we have here is this great picture. Um, Actually, one of the most quoted scriptures in all of the Bible is Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 is actually um, one of the most commonly quoted passages. You see this crocheted on pillows and, and put online and things there, but it actually is a depiction of shepherds, and so Jesus, speaking to a Jewish audience, would know this passage pretty well. And here you have the author, you have David writing this in Psalm 23, and he says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Everything in this passage is just this uplifting, incredible message, this idea that he leads me, that I shall not want. I think it's interesting, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. That shows that as sheep, we don't necessarily follow. <laughs> that you have to, if you've ever had to put a child down for a nap or bedtime, you understand that phrase, to make someone lie down. <laughs> like, no, lie down. But where is he, what is he forcing us to do? He's forcing us to recognize the green pastures and still waters that are right next to us. That he restores my soul, that he leads me in paths of righteousness. We tend to brush through the phrase, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But that means that you are surrounded by darkness and difficulty, but yet in the middle of that valley, that dark moment that Jesus is there. And then he builds on that by saying that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That is an incredible picture if you think about it, to be surrounded by enemies, but right there you have the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one feast with the Lord. He doesn't, rem understand this, he doesn't remove the enemies and the difficult situations around you, but rather he invites you to a feast in the middle of your mess. That when you feel like you are stressed and you're hurting and you are in worry and you're struggling and you have all kinds of issues and questions and like, man, finances are difficult, relationships are difficult, a difficulty at my job, health is difficult, everything around, all you're surrounded by enemies, whatever those enemies are, but yet right in that exact moment, Jesus is not afraid. In fact, he invites you to have a feast with him. But sadly, Sometimes what we do is that we, we go to this feast with Jesus and then we ask him, we say, hey God, hey, do you mind if I let another person join us? And we take our worry and we say, hey, pull, pull up a seat. If you start hearing that phrase that you're not good enough, that you're not gonna make it, and you start doubting, you start questioning, and you start getting bitter and angry, what you've done is that you've invited another person into that table. You've invited doubt into that table. When Jesus, the good shepherd, has prepared a meal, a feast before you, even in the presence of your enemies, he anoints your head with oil, and goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and that ultimately you get to dwell with him forever. So you have this incredible picture. And the truth is, is that if you're taking notes, you can write this down, that Jesus is the good shepherd and he is worthy to be followed. Jesus is the good shepherd, which means that he is worthy to be followed. Because in the John passage, you have hired hands, you have sheep, and then you have the shepherd. We already talked about how hired hands are just temporary, but they're out when the going gets tough. But the sheep in the scenario, that's us. Now, sheep are not exactly the smartest animals. In fact, last week, if you were here, we talked about how you're not gonna find a college who has the fighting sheep, right? If you filled out a March Madness bracket, none of the teams that are left have sheep as the mascot. It's because sheep are not very smart. In fact, sheep, when left to their own devices, are not going to make it. Let me prove it to you. There is, don't put the picture up yet, but there is a story in Australia a couple years ago of a sheep who escaped in the fields um, there in Australia and for six years eluded the shepherds and actually hid in caves. And his name was Shrek. And, but what happens is the wool of a sheep keeps growing, 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 unless the shepherd shears the wool. And it actually becomes dangerous. And so after six years of not knowing where the sheep was, they finally found Shrek. And take a look at Shrek that they found. His wool had gotten so thick, that's 60 pounds of wool, that he almost died because he avoided the shepherd for so long and had no one to take care of him that the wool just kept going and going and going. And so Shrek was saved and they, they actually um, took about a half hour to hour and kind of sheared him and, and took off 60 pounds 
of wool and saved his life and went on to live a few more years. And, uh, but that, like, you wonder why sheep are not seen as a strong, smart animal. That would be why. That's us, okay? We're Shrek in this scenario, okay? We need help. Um, so if we've talked about the hired hands, we've talked about sheep, which is us, that we need leading, we need the help of a shepherd. Well, what exactly makes Jesus good? What exactly makes Jesus good? Well, I believe it's two things. It's his authenticity, and then it's his authority. We're gonna break these down. His authenticity, and then his authority. The first thing is that his authenticity. And by authenticity, I mean that Christ's love is unconditional. Jesus loves us not because we had the best bah or because we performed the best tricks or things that are, no. He loves us because he chose to love us. His love for us is not based on anything that we do, but based on who he is. The idea of Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and Holy Spirit, means that God had perfect relationship inside of the Trinity. And so that he created mankind not to get something, but so that he could give something and demonstrate and show his glory and love towards us. So we've done nothing to deserve his love. And so how do we know that Jesus is the real deal? How do we know that Jesus is authentic? I believe he shares four things from this John 10 passage. Number one, we see that Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is worthy to be followed because he died on a cross for you and for me. Four times, in fact, in seven verses, he says, I lay my life down. He does not use his power to to come down on us, but actually to come down and to save us and to lift us up. So we know that Jesus is authentic and his love is unconditional because he lays his life down. Number two, we know because he fights our battles. He fights our battles. Have you ever seen a fight break out in public before? Uh, I was, I was actually on a, um, I was on a mission trip. Uh, if you wanna hear some crazy stories I can share later, but um, not a smart idea necessarily to, per se to just take 30 middle school and high school kids through inner city New York on a mission trip, just saying through the subway system. But um, we did and so we were there and we were on the subway and it was like one of the national day parades was going on. And so sometimes with holidays, there's some drinking that goes along with that. And so um, a fight broke out in the subway car that we're in right after this parade. And I got like little middle schoolers with squeaky voices. And so I saw the fight break out and you know, I have this like rescue mentality, right? And so you know what I did? I don't know them. <laughs> That's what I did exactly. I wish I was like, yeah, I broke it up and saved it. I'm like, uh-uh, not my fight. All right, okay, kids, turn away from the punches, okay? And then, um, and literally a SWAT team came down and broke up the fight and it was intense. But when I saw something break out in the subway car, I'm like, uh, not today, <laughs> right? But here's the thing. When Jesus sees the fights that we're going through, when he sees us under attack, there's never one moment where God goes, "Mm -mm, not today. He never, even when we get into our own mess, even when we pick the fight and we get into trouble, there's never a moment where Jesus looks at us and goes, not today. He enters our battles. And so we know that his love is unconditional. But thirdly, if you're taking notes, is that he knows us. He knows us. God is not some abstract idea that there's some being somewhere, but he's actually described as our heavenly father. And Jesus says that he knows, he calls the sheep by name. He knows us. But then lastly, Jesus is known by us. See, you can know somebody, but then they not know you. Like if you have a researcher or somebody 
if you picture like test subjects, like they put them through an experiment and you have somebody on the other side of the glass. The person on the other side of the glass knows who's on the inside, but it's like a double-sided mirror. You don't know who's watching you. Sometimes I think we act like God is that way, that we believe that God is like somehow knows us, but we have no access, no interaction with him. But Jesus says, no, I am a personal loving shepherd. I know them, call them by name, and they know my voice. So this is much more like a spouse relationship or a parent-child relationship where you actually know and can hear the voice of God on a regular basis and draw near to him. And so we know that God's love is unconditional because he lays down his life. He fights our battles He knows us and is known by us. This is completely different than any other religion in all of the world. Any other religion has some type of higher being that creates the world, that then there's separation and there's judgment, and then you have to work as hard as you can to try to make your way back, and I may or may not let you in based on what you do. Christianity is completely different because we follow the good shepherd whose love is unconditional and that's demonstrated by the fact that he lays his life down for us, he fights our battles, that he knows us and calls us by name, and then he says that he can be known by us and we can draw close to him. And and that's why Christianity is described not as a religion, but as a relationship. Back in 2012, there was a guy named George um, Tyson He was going for a walk with his son. He was about 60 years old. His son was um, heavily disabled, and and he was about 30 years old. And he was going for a walk, and they turned the corner, and a car went speeding out of control. And it was heading right for his son. And without a second thought, he dove and pushed his disabled son out of the way right as the car came in. And the son was saved But George Tyson that day lost his life. And he lost his life by throwing his body in front of a car and taking the place of his son who could not help himself and do that on his own. When someone loves unconditionally, that we're moved. And that's what Jesus did. We have impending judgment and and sin and the weight of that coming, barreling barreling down right at us. And Jesus shoves us out of the way or even lifts us up. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5 that he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of him. You can trust and follow the good shepherd because he is authentic, he is real, because he lays his life down, because he fights our battles, because he knows you and you can know him. But also, Jesus is the good shepherd Because he has authority, meaning that Christ's power is unbreakable. You see, we always talk about the fact that Jesus is the good shepherd and lays his life down for the sheep. But I never actually played that out until I got to the last verse, verse 18. He says, but I actually have the authority to take it up again. And that's really important to understand because if he was just a normal shepherd and he sacrificed himself, and he dies on behalf of the sheep. Let me just ask you, what happens to the sheep at that point? The wolves are dead, the shepherd's dead. Where do the sheep go? They got nothing. So they just kind of extend and wander and feel lost. But see, Jesus didn't stop there. He actually has the authority to do three things. Number one, We already mentioned that Jesus has the authority or the power to lay down his life. That's called sacrifice. But secondly, Jesus has the power to raise up his life. It wasn't this epic battle between good and evil that Jesus temporarily lost and then came back and won. He says, no, I gave it up willingly. They did not take my life. I gave it for you. They did not take something from me, but I give something to you. You see, laying down his life is sacrifice, and that covers our sin. But the fact that Jesus has the power 
to raise himself from the dead in conjunction with God the Father means that he can conquer sin. Think about that for a second. The fact that he lays his life down covers our sin. But the fact that he raises it back up means he conquers sin and he conquers death. And there is nothing that Satan can do. I recently heard a story of um, snake charmers in other countries. Um, Do you know one of the secrets of snake charmers? Did you know that in some countries when they have snake charmers, they actually glue the mouth of the snake shut? It's a true story. And some of them they do. They glue the mouth of the snake shut. And so when they play and the snake gets up and dances, and it looks really scary, but it can't do anything. Satan is that snake with his mouth glued shut. He can pop up and he can look real scary to you. But because Jesus rose again from the grave, that he crushed Satan and that there is nothing he can do to take away your salvation. You can't earn your way into heaven. Therefore, you can't sin your way out of heaven. And so we can receive life because we follow the good shepherd that lays his life down, but then picks it back up again because he has the power to do so. And if Jesus has the power to raise himself Self from the dead, and there is nothing, no sin, no addiction, nothing that can separate us from the love of God if you believe in him, amen? But then he doesn't even stop there. Because he says, and I love this phrase in verse 16, there are other sheep in the fold. If he doesn't raise himself back up, how can he go get other sheep? Now in the context, he was talking to a Jewish faith, and then he actually extends Um, salvation to all Gentiles, which is basically anybody not Jewish. And so he actually opens up salvation to the world. And in this verse, we are included in this verse where he says, I have other sheep to bring in the fold. And here's what's awesome, is that the fact that he has the authority to bring in other sheep, that is mission. Check out what it says in Matthew 28. That's known as the Great Commission. It says here, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Did you know that that word authority, that word power, is the same word we read in John 10? So the very power that rose him from the grave is the power that he uses to tell us to go and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The power of Jesus is unbreakable because he lays down his life, that sacrifice. He raises it back up again, that's salvation. But then he brings more sheep in, that's mission. And that's why we're here today. You are here today and you believe those who already call him a savior because of this verse right here and because he has the power to do that. And we gather and we go and we love and serve our community in practical ways because we believe that God's not done. I believe that he's just getting started. And I think he's going to use you and use me to do that. As the band comes back up on stage, I just want to close with this. Is that, do you believe that Jesus is the good shepherd? Not just a head acknowledgement. I understand that. I was a youth pastor for 12 years. I would go into the high school to have lunch with teenagers. And, you know, when I go into elementary school and I know kids, they're like, hey, Pastor John. Do you know what I would get when I go into high school? What's up? (laughs) And it'd be from a distance. They'd check first, look and see if their friends are watching, and then they'd go, (laughs) Finally, they had a conversation. It's like, man, like, We've spent hours together. We've gone on mission trips together. We've spent every single week, we talk, we laugh, we cry, we joke, we worship. And I walk into your school and you can't even take your hand out of your pocket to raise it to say hello because that's too much energy. And so you just give me, so. Like you have a, something in your neck, you're wrong, are you okay? Like what? And, like, and then after they would talk with their friends and then before they go to class, they'd run up and go, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, now you want to say hi. Okay. Here's the thing. Some of us, I think, do that with Jesus. He is the good shepherd. And at most we go, yeah, what's up? We acknowledge him. We're like, oh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go once on Sunday. 
I'll go once a year. I'll sing a song. No, there's so much more than that. That Christianity is about the good shepherd who is authentic and genuine and excellent and incredible and better than anything this world has to offer. And we know that his love is unconditional because he laid his life down, because he fights our battles, because ultimately he knows us and he has invited us to know him, that it's not a religion, it's a relationship. But not only is Jesus authentic, he actually has the authority and the power to do something about it. Have you ever made a phone call because you've had a complaint at a business and you talk to a worker who has no authority whatsoever? Oh yeah, man, that's not a bummer. See, awareness of a problem is not enough. You actually need the authority and the ability to go do something about that. But as the good shepherd, he has the power to lay down his life to sacrifice his life and to cover our sin. He has the power to raise it back up again, which means that he can conquer sin and death and that we can be forgiven and saved and have meaning and purpose. But then he also has the power to call us on mission and the same power, the same name that rose and conquered death is the same name and the power that has given us our mission to go and make disciples of all the world. There's other sheep in the fold. At the very name of Jesus, we can tremble, but then we can have confidence, not in ourselves, but in our shepherd. Let's pray. God, you are the good shepherd. And because of you, we come before you, God. And we know that even though we walk through the valley, even though we're surrounded by enemies, surrounded by difficult circumstances, God, We tremble at your name because at your name, we can receive forgiveness and salvation. You prepare a table before us, invite us to a feast, call us by name. Because you are the good shepherd, God, we are forgiven and we are saved and we are freed and we are put on mission. Help us to live on mission for you. Help us to tremble at your name. Help us to be grateful that you're not just a shepherd, but you are the good, authentic, and authoritative shepherd that brings salvation to our souls. We love you, God. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, I want to do something a little bit different this morning. And we're going to start, and they're going to do a song. And I want to start seated because I want to give you a chance for you guys to reflect. But if you reach that point in this song, where you're willing to acknowledge him as the good shepherd and that time to response, I wanna encourage you then that if to worship however you see fit, whether that's standing once the time comes, whether that's staying seated and in prayer, whatever this time you need to have with God, I want you to have that and reflect on the goodness of the name of Jesus.